Good morning, students. Today we are going to speak about uh, seizures, including febrile seizures in children. Uh, this is quite a familiar topic to you. You have been hearing about it in medicine as well as when you come to the clinical postings. So I'll just briefly take you through what are seizures. So, how do we classify what are the etiopathogenesis, what are the different causes, and how do we manage them? And with a special reference to febrile seizures, because it is one of the most common type of seizures that we see in children. So, we will briefly cover about the febrile seizures. So, I want you to take a note of this. So, what is the definition of a seizure? So, a seizure is defined as a transient occurrence of signs and or symptoms so you have to take note of this so it need not be always both signs and symptoms so it can be only signs and or symptoms which result due to the abnormal excessive or synchronous neuronal activity in the brain so this is the definition of seizure so you must have heard these three terms seizure convulsion and epilepsy so are they the same or can we use them interchangeably so just a brief uh, know of what are these three terminologies so just now i have defined seizure so in addition so you have to know it can manifest as motor sensory autonomic or even psychic disturbance with or without alteration in the sensorium so this is a seizure coming to convulsion if there is a seizure with predominant motor manifestation then we say it is a convulsion like for example if you have uh, we know about absent seizures so where a child will just sit and stare or whatever activity he is doing there will be a brief interruption in the activity so that is what we call as absent seizure but there is no motor component in absence seizure. So we never say absence convulsion. We say it is an absence seizure. Whereas if you take a generalized tonic-clonic convulsion, so there is a predominant motor component to that. So that time we say it is a generalized tonic-clonic type of convulsion or seizure. So if there is a predominant motor manifestation in a seizure, you can interchangeably use it as convulsion. So then what is epilepsy? Then are all seizures epilepsy? No. So if you have two or more recurrent seizures, which occur in an interval more than 24 hours apart, only then you will label it as epilepsy. So just one seizure, you can't label the child as epilepsy. And moreover, these seizures should be unprovoked seizures. So details, I'll again come back to this. So, at this point, you have to understand that seizure is a, because of the transient uh, disturbance in the brain function, which manifests can be as motor, sensory, autonomic, with or without alteration in the sensorium. But if there is a predominant motor manifestation, then we can call it as a convulsion. And if you have two seizures which occur at an interval greater than 24 hours apart, then you can label it as epilepsy. So now we have seen that abnormal movements are all seizures then. So are all abnormal movements seizures? So answer is no. You have something called as seizure mimics. That is, these conditions will appear like a seizure. They mimic a seizure, but they are not actually seizure. It's a long list of conditions, but here I have just put a few which are very common and which we need to really differentiate between a seizure and a seizure mimic. So the first one is a psychogenic seizure. 
so as a name tells it could be a it's not a true seizure or it is called a pseudo seizure so the present terminology which is being given for psychogenic seizure is psychogenic non epileptic seizures that is pnes that is psychogenic non epileptic seizures so when we take a history of seizure the pattern of limb movements whether it is what are the preceding events what are the following events what is the type of movements how is the sensorium of the child does the child get any injury so these are the very significant points which help us to differentiate whether it is a true seizure or a psychogenic seizure coming to synco so many must have experienced like standing in your uh, dissection hall or even during your clinics we have seen many children telling i am feeling dizzy i want to sit so um, many of the times children are brought with a complaint that this child was standing just had some uh, abnormal movements and the child just uh, collapsed so we need to differentiate whether it is a seizure or a synco so what happens in syncope is there is a triggering event like a prolonged standing or some pain or child might be uh, standing under the sun or child had some preceding vomiting then the child will have an event like child suddenly becomes pale de develops profuse sweating then they may have some blurring of vision dizziness nausea and then they collapse and lose consciousness so this is the typical sequence that we see in synco so whereas even in a seizure sometimes they can have a aura so all these preceding events can present like a aura and then a child can have a seizure so only thing which will differentiate is the pace so in synco all this will be slow and gradual whereas in epileptic or it will be sudden and short in duration so a proper history will help in differentiating between a syncope and a seizure coming to migraine one particular subtype of migraine which we call as benign paroxysmal vertigo of childhood so this is one condition which will almost mimic a seizure and child will be brought with a complaints of abnormal deviation of the head towards one side so uh, this is mostly due to the abnormal vestibular function so again a proper history and investigation will help us to differentiate among these two coming to breath holding spell which is again a very common presentation which we see in the pediatric age group so what happens in a breath holding spell is any trigger like child uh, has a pain or child is adamant about something something was taken away from the child so a trigger and child starts crying excessively then starts holding the breath and then can either become cyanosed or sometimes they can develop a seizure and this is most commonly seen in the age group of 6 to 18 months of age so a preceding history of child crying excessively then holding the breath and then throwing a seizure will help you to differentiate between a true seizure and a breath holding spell so coming to some of the sleep disturbances so there are some sleep related disorders which can again mimic like a seizure so there are three things which you need to know one is benign sleep myoclonus other is night terrors and nightmares coming to benign sleep myoclonus it is usually seen in the neonatal period so newborns during sleep can sometimes develop small jerky movements that is called the benign sleep myoclonus seen in the newborn so it is not a true seizure and it is a self limiting condition so coming to the other two that is night terrors and nightmares night terrors is usually seen in children between 2 to 7 years of age child would have uh, slept for some time suddenly wakes up with a scream appears terrified might have some tachycardia tachypnea child will be unresponsive during the episode it is very difficult to arouse the child and there will be little or no vocalization so this is the typical night terror history whereas coming to nightmares it occurs later during the night and child usually remembers the event so this is the nightmare 
so very uh, detailed history can most of the time help us to differentiate among these two ticks is like very common which you have uh, seen most of the time they can be motor ticks like just blinking of eyes or just throat clearing so uh, again a history is very important in differentiating the seizure uh, from a tick just one more word about the hyperreflexia so hyperreflexia it's a condition where there will be episodes of tonic stiffening child will suddenly become stiff will have apnea and then will develop a seizure so you should look for a typical triad of hyperreflexia that is child will be generalized stiffness there will be nocturnal myoclonus and pathologic startle reflex if these three are there with the child behaving like this then we usually think of hyperreflexia so this was briefly about the seizure mimics so then we will just go through what actually causes a seizure in a child so uh, in our seizure history we definition of seizure we read that it is due to the Uh, paroxysmal discharges in the brain so if a brain tissue or a neuron has to be stable there has to be a balance between the excitatory neurotransmitters and the inhibitory neurotransmitters so the common excitatory neurotransmitters are the glutamate and aspartate and the inhibitory neurotransmitter is the gaba so if the scale tilts to one side it can be either due to increase in the excitatory neurotransmitters or due to decrease in the inhibitory neurotransmitters so whenever this imbalance occurs then you the child tends to have a seizure or a epilepsy so the key unit of neurotransmission is a synapse and the fundamental component of a synapse is your ion channel so that's that is what we are seeing here so there could be any cause of injury so then the injury causes influx of the sodium into the neuronal cells which also facilitates influx of the calcium and this releases the glutamate into the synapse so as we just read glutamate is a Uh, excitatory neurotransmitter and it indirectly decreases the gabaergic inhibition so these two mechanisms cause a seizure in a child so now that we know there is a seizure we have understood what is the pathophysiology of a seizure coming to the classification of childhood seizures so this was a old classification where they used to tell it as a generalized seizure or a partial seizure so but now the present classification is what we call as the revised classification ilae classification that is the international league against epilepsy so this is the present classification of seizures which we need to follow so it has been you should note rather than the pattern of seizure now the stress is upon the onset of seizure so there are four main sub types focal onset generalized onset unknown onset and unclassified so i'll repeat it for you so the four sub types of seizures according to the revised classification are focal onset generalized onset unknown onset and unclassified so irrespective of the type of onset child can have a motor component non motor component you can see that even in generalized there is a motor and non motor even in unknown onset there is a motor and non motor component so coming to this focal onset again there is a sub category that whether aware or impaired awareness so earlier when we used to say generalized seizure and partial seizure we used to uh, concentrate on whether child was conscious during the event or not conscious during the event so the term that have changed now is awareness instead of consciousness it is whether the child was aware or impaired awareness 
so the motor components can be automatisms atonic seizure clonic epileptic spasms hyperkinetic myoclonic and tonic non motor can be anything can be autonomic cognitive emotional and sensory so coming to again generalize motor again they can have tonic clonic clonic tonic myoclonic myoclonic tonic clonic so there can be a mixture of all these type of seizures so basically you should know these four subtypes that is focal onset generalized onset unknown onset and unclassified and in focal whether it is aware or impaired awareness and sometimes they can go to focal to bilateral tonic clonic so what do we understand by this is that focal by that i mean that the trigger is focal it is localized to a particular area whereas generalized is the foci may be at some one point but the impact is generalized so it involves the entire cortical area so the same classification again so just a revision for you so whether it is focal onset seizure generalized onset seizures unknown onset or unclassified seizures hope i am clear with this new classification so in focal onset you should know whether it is motor non motor and whether there is a focal to bilateral tonic clonic so what is the revised classification say so what does the revised classification say so earlier so when earlier we had a classification as generalized seizure and partial seizure i hope you would have heard terms like simple partial seizure and complex partial seizure by simple partial seizure we would usually tell it is a focal seizure with uh, intact consciousness so the same term is now replaced by what we say as focal aware seizure so simple partial seizure is no more used it has been replaced by this term as focal aware seizure so similarly complex partial seizure was like focal seizure with altered sensorium or altered consciousness we used to call it as complex partial so now it has been replaced as focal seizures with impaired awareness okay so simple partial replaced as focal aware and complex partial has been replaced as focal seizures with impaired awareness so just briefly i'll tell you about the different patterns of seizures that we saw under these headings so then what is a tonic seizure so as the name tells tonic so there is a increased tone or rigidity so just the limb will go into one particular position and child will hold it very stiff then we say it is a tonic seizure so atonic seizures are characterized by flexibility or lack of movement so there is sudden loss of tone so that is what we call as atonic seizures whereas clonic clonus so which consists of rhythmic and fast muscle contraction and slightly longer relaxations then we say it as a clonic seizures whereas myoclonus is a shock like contraction of a muscle so which is brief jerky contractions and which keeps getting repeated so these are the four main patterns of seizure and there can be a combination of this like there can be a tonic clonic there can be a tonic atonic 
or tonic myoclonic. So there will be a combination of these different patterns. So if you can see in the first picture, there is a generalized increase in tone. You can see the fixed posture of the limb and the child is holding his limbs very tight. Whereas during the clonic phase, there will be release and contraction. So there will be jerky movements of the limbs. That is the clonic phase. So if you can see this child, he has limb is in a fixed and tight position. So this is like a tonic, child sensorium is impaired. So it is a generalized tonic type of seizure. So a tonic is, if you see child would have been just standing comfortably or doing something and suddenly drops. So this is a typical atonic seizure. They are also called as drop attacks. So myoclonic seizure is child would be child will just flex on his body. So this is called the myoclonic seizure or flexor spasms as seen in the West syndrome. So this is the typical myoclonic jerk, like a embracing movement. The hands will go apart and then child will bring it together as if he is embracing something in a jerk. So having known what is a seizure and what is the pathophysiology and what are the different types. So just let us briefly know what causes a seizure. So it can be put under broad headings like whether it is infections. So it can be bacterial meningitis, tubercular meningitis or aseptic meningitis or a viral encephalitis, cerebral malaria, tetanus, mumps, measles or intrauterine torch infections can also present a seizure. So there are some metabolic causes for seizure, could be dehydration, dyselectrolytemia, acid-base imbalance, hypo or hyperglycemia and some of the inborn errors of metabolism. Because of the abnormal metabolites, again child can throw a seizure. Then you have the whole different set of a febrile seizure again. It can be post-infectious because of space occupying lesions like a brain tumor or a brain abscess or a tuberculoma, neurocystic sarcosis, vascular causes like AV malformation, intracranial thrombosis, hemorrhage. Some of the genetic causes like congenital malformations, neuromigrational defects or even trauma, head injury and some of the miscellaneous causes like HIE in a newborn period heat stroke because of uh, hypertension when we call it as hypertensive encephalopathy, neurodegenerative and storage disorders and sometimes drugs and poisons can also cause seizures. So when we looked at all these causes, there are, you would have noted there are some causes which will persist so that child is definitely prone to throw seizures again and again. Whereas some are because of the transient problem like a acid base imbalance or a dyselectrolytemia. So you have to differentiate whether it is an epileptic type of seizure or a non-epileptic type of seizure. So as we already told for epilepsy there should be a persistent predisposition to generate seizure then we will think of epilepsy and to clinically diagnose as epilepsy child should have two or more unprovoked seizures and in a time frame of longer than 24 hours apart then we think of epilepsy whereas all others will become like provoked seizure like because of fever child throws seizure because of hyponatremia child has seizure which once gets corrected child will not have one more episode again so those children will not be labeled as epilepsy so how do we evaluate a child when he presents to us with a seizure? So first and foremost is history taking. So you need to take a very detailed history of what is the type. So what exactly happened? Where did it start? How did it progress? Whether there was any motor component, whether there was any sensory symptom? Was it tonic, clonic? Okay, and was there any associated sensory disturbances? and what was the duration of the seizure and frequency, whether did it recur again and how long did it last. And very important whether the child was aware or conscious of during the episode. 
so behavior of the child preceding the seizure and postictal after the seizure like whether the child just slept off whether the child had any headache or whether there was any neuro deficits whether the child spoke anything like vocalizations or whether there was loss of any sphincter control and whether if child had any preceding aura again that can help us so just to know a bit of etiology you need to know whether there is any preceding trauma whether child has any fever during the episode whether there is any accidental ingestion of any drug any toxins or perinatal history which can give us clue to if this child had any touch infection or birth asphyxia or neonatal jaundice or some sepsis whether child had any meningitis or encephalitis like episodes in the past whether there is any family history of seizures or epilepsy or any neurodevelopmental problems and take a detailed developmental history of this child then the detailed neurological history to know if this child had any deficits like a hemiplegic cp can present at some later age with seizure so if we get a history like this child has hemiplegia and now developed seizure then we automatically know that this is a case of hemiplegic cp with seizures so when you examine in particular you have to make a note of the head circumference so because microcephaly with seizures again your causes are entirely different so very important to check the head circumference length and weight whether to know child has been growing appropriate for the age very important clues can be got by a detailed ophthalmologic evaluation so we can look for whether there is any papillary edema optic neuritis retinal hemorrhages uveitis as well as retinal phacoma look for any syndromic features or facial features so any particular syndromes which are prone to develop seizures again that can help us and always look for any neurocutaneous markers and whether the child has any hepatosplenomegaly so this can give to clue to some neurometabolic disorders so in examination in addition to neurological examination so these things should be looked for so there are some neurocutaneous syndromes so as a marker of them you can have this neurocutaneous markers so all these black spots these are called cephalid spots which is seen in neurofibromatosis so if you look at this nodules on the face this is called adenoma sebaceum this is called chagrin patch chagrin patch here which is seen in tuberous sclerosis again it is a neurocutaneous syndrome these children are prone to develop seizures epilepsy when they grow so you should always look for these neurocutaneous markers so if you know see the face there is a hemangioma on the face and there is a calcification here so this is a case of sturge weber syndrome which is again a neurocutaneous syndrome so once we have taken a proper history and so now we know it is a seizure how do we confirm it so we need to do some investigations so which investigations to order and when to do so eeg is one of the most sensitive tool for diagnosis it shows the changes in the electrical activity of the brain does have some drawbacks like children with even normal neurodevelopment with no seizure can sometimes show abnormality on eeg and on the other end child with frank seizures eeg may sometimes come out to be normal because what they say is the electrodes are placed in the superficial cortical area so if the neuronal activity is in the deeper cortex sometimes eeg may not pick up so the main help is in the categorization of the seizure and choice of the anti epileptic drug so if you can see here these are called spike and wave pattern which suggests that there is a seizure like activity so if it is noted in very few limbs then we say it is a focal seizure whereas a generalized pattern like this we say it is a generalized discharges so neuro imaging we can do structural scans like ct and mri it can pick up any structural lesions malformations or a previous hie like event so all that can be picked up in the mri so there is something called functional scans like pet and spectrum 
So these can identify areas of abnormal metabolism. This is more helpful when you are evaluating a child with focal seizures. So now that I have done the investigation and I, now I will categorize them. So as you see, this is the old categorization of partial and generalized. So instead now this will be focal seizure and this will be generalized seizure. So for a focal seizure, carbamazepine is the first choice of drug or you can use valproate also and these are the second line drugs. Whereas for a generalized drug seizure, valproate is the first choice. Only if you have a myoclonic type of seizure, then you would prefer adding clonazepam. Otherwise, for generalized seizure, valproate works very well. For a uh, focal seizure, carbamazepine is the preferred drug. Uh, for absent seizure, ethosuximide is preferred. So otherwise, most of the drugs, valproate will suffice. So just uh, note about the dosage of the commonly used anti-epileptic drugs. Phenobarbiton, it is 3 to 5 mg per kg per day. Phenytoin, it is 5 to 8. You can go up to 10 mg per kg per day. Carbamazepine dose is 10 to 20 mg per kg per day. For ethosuximide, it is 20 to 30 mg per kg per day. And for valproate, it is 30 to 50 mg per kg per day. So ideally, once we categorize the seizure, we know whether it is focal or generalized. Based on that, you will start the first appropriate anti-epileptic drug. You will start at the lower end of the recommended dose and on a weekly basis, you will increase till you achieve a seizure control. Imagine you achieve the maximum possible for the first drug and child still continues to have seizures. Then you will add on a second drug. So that is the importance of doing EEG and categorization of the seizure. So just a brief about the side effects. So carbamazepine, common is it causes drowsiness, dizziness, some ataxia, diplopia. But the serious toxicity is agranulocytosis and Steven Johnson syndrome. Again with clonazepam, hypotonia, salivary and bronchial hypersecretion, paradoxical hyperactivity and aggressiveness. Phenytoin, as you know, it can cause ataxia, diplopia, rash, gum hyperplasia, hirsutism. It can cause megaloblastic anemia and it impairs the vitamin D metabolism. So they can develop osteomalacia also. So for uh, girls, usually phenytoin will not be preferred because it can cause all this hirsutism. Phenobarbiton, it can cause cognitive dysfunction, ataxia, rash, and behavioral disturbances. Serious toxicities, it is a known hepatic toxic. It can cause hepatic injury and Steven Johnson syndrome again. Valproate, in addition to uh, problems like epigastric pain, tremor, alopecia, weight gain, hair loss, thrombocytopenia, hepatic toxicity is the most serious effect. So, valproate is not preferred less than two years of age. It can also cause pancreatitis and encephalopathy like presentation. So, just summing up the toxicity, the most serious form, phenobarbiton, on the CNS it causes hyperactivity, phenytoin causes ataxia, carbamazepine causes agranulocytosis and Steven Johnson syndrome, valproate is hepatotoxic. Benzodiazepines like your uh, clonazepam, they all can cause respiratory depression. So topiramate will cause renal stones. So once now we have already started the anti-epileptic drug and we have achieved seizure control. So when do you stop the anti-epileptic drugs? So if once you achieve seizure freedom for more than two years, then you can gradually taper and stop the anti-epileptic drugs. So you should usually taper it over two to three months because some of these children, once when we start tapering, they can throw a breakthrough seizure. So we have to do it very gradually. So these are the list of some of the newer anti-epileptic drugs. That is gabapentin, lamotrigine, topiramate, clobazam, felbamate, vigapatrin, tegabin, pregapalin, oxcarbazine, levitristam, and zonisamide. 
so these are some of the newer anti epileptic drugs so sometimes not all seizures get controlled only with our anti epileptic drugs so you have started one drug two drug maybe multiple anti convulsants so that we say as polytherapy so despite multiple anti convulsants if you are not able to achieve seizure control so next what so one option will be to add the newer anti epileptic drugs and uh, which have some novel mechanism of action so if that doesn't work then you might have to consider surgery for some of these children like you might have to do a resection of the lobe which is causing the seizure or hemispherectomy or multiple subpile resection or carpus callostomy some of the other methods are vagus nerve stimulation and ketogenic diet so this is something which is coming up now putting the child on ketogenic diet so this seems to modify the way the neurons uh, react to the stimuli and behavioral modification so now let us move on to febrile seizures so what is a febrile seizure so these are seizures that occur between the age of 6 and 16 months in a developmentally normal child with a temperature of 38 degree centigrade or 100.4 degree fahrenheit or higher that are not the result of central nervous system infection or any metabolic imbalance and that occur in the absence of a history of prior afebrile seizures so each and every word in this definition is important so seizure so common age group is 6 to 60 months and it should be a developmentally normal child with a fever and there should not be any metabolic imbalance or a cns infection and this child should not have had any previous a febrile seizures or unprovoked seizure so only then we will say it as a febrile seizure so what causes a febrile seizure so many children get fever but not all through a seizure so what causes a particular child with fever to develop a seizure so they have noted that there is some genetic predisposition that only few children with fever develop seizure if one sibling has febrile seizure so the risk of the other sibling getting febrile seizure is almost 10% and if one of the parent has febrile seizure then the risk is 50% so this proves that there is probably some genetic role in the febrile seizure and other some illnesses like otitis media bronchopneumonia post dpt immunization gastroenteritis some upper respiratory infection and measles these can also sometimes trigger a febrile seizure so how do we classify febrile seizure so there are basically two types one is simple febrile seizure and complex febrile seizure so when does a febrile seizure label as simple febrile so if it is a generalized tonic clonic not more than 15 minutes and if it does not recur within a 24 hour period and there is no neurological sequelae then we say it as a febrile seizure so it should be generalized tonic clonic not more than 15 minutes and does not recur within a 24 hour period and there are no neuro deficits after the seizure then we say it is a simple febrile seizure and most of these children will have a very short postictal period and they will become normal within few minutes as if nothing has happened whereas complex febrile as the name tells it is more prolonged it is more than 15 minutes it can be focal and or recurs within 24 hours so if it is like febrile seizure and focal then we say it is focal uh, complex febrile seizure if the seizure duration is more than 15 minutes even though it is a generalized tonic clonic then again we say it as a complex febrile seizure and within 24 hours if the child is having recurrent febrile seizure again we say it is a complex febrile seizure so what you need to understand is not all the three should be there to say complex any one if it is there also we will label it as complex febrile seizure i just want you to know these two terms 
which uh, is usually used in regard with febrile seizure. One is febrile status epilepticus. That is, if a febrile seizure is lasting more than 30 minutes, then we say it as febrile status epilepticus. And the other new terminology is simple febrile seizure plus. That is, if the child has recurrent simple febrile seizures within 24 hours, then we say it as simple febrile seizure plus. So, what are the risk factors which will help us predict that whether this child will have a recurrent febrile seizure? So, major risk factors and minor risk factors. So, age less than one year. If a nine-month-old has developed febrile seizure for the first time, so you will put him as a major risk factor because the age is less than one year. Duration of fever, very short duration fever and very low fever seizure threshold. Hardly 38-39 child is throwing seizure. That means this child has a very low fever seizure threshold. So these are the major risk factors. Whereas minor risk factors are if there is a family history of febrile seizure, family history of epilepsy, and if it is a complex febrile seizure, if this child goes to daycare because he is prone for recurrent uh, upper respiratory infections and all. Male child. And if this child has a lower serum sodium at the time of admission, so these all become the minor risk factor which will help us to know whether this child can have a recurrence of a febrile seizure. So what is the recurrence risk? So now we have told about the major risk factors and minor risk factors. If there are no risk factor for this child, then the recurrence risk is around 12%. If there is one risk factor, then the risk, uh, recurrence risk is 25 to 50 percent. If there are two risk factors, it is 50 to 59 percent. And if the child has three or more risk factors, then the risk is quite high. It is 73 to 100 percent. So that was the risk factor for recurrence of febrile seizure. And but what we are concerned is whether this child will progress on to epilepsy. So I think by now you are clear about the terms seizure and epilepsy. So for epilepsy, it should be unprovoked and more than 24 hours apart, child should have two episodes. So what starts as febrile seizure, whether it will progress on to an unprovoked epilepsy. So what are the risk factors? For a child with simple febrile seizure, the risk of developing epilepsy is only 1%. Whereas if the child has recurrent febrile seizure, 4% chance of developing epilepsy. If it is a complex febrile seizure, then it becomes 6%. If the fever was just less than one hour before the febrile seizure, then 11%. If there is family history of epilepsy, the risk increases. For complex febrile seizures, it is with focal seizure, the risk becomes 29%. And if the child has any neurodevelopmental issues, then the risk is 33%. So how do you evaluate a febrile child with seizure? So investigation will be like any other child with fever. So you will do a proper clinical history to know what is the source of infection. You will take a history to know whether there is any meningitis like presentation. So you have to take a detailed clinical history whether this child has had any chronic illnesses in the past any recent antibiotics or recent vaccination because we just told DPT can also trigger a febrile seizure. So main aim will be to rule out a meningitis or encephalitis. So we will do the detailed blood investigations. We will do a blood sugar, calcium and electrolytes. These are the basic investigation you will do for a febrile seizure. So if you are very clear that this child has a simple febrile seizure, then you need not do EEG on neuroimaging or LP routinely. But if you have any clue or any suspicion of a meningitis or an encephalitis or there is some developmental delay, then you go ahead and do with these investigations. So when should we do a lumbar puncture in a child with suspected simple febrile seizure? If the child is between 6 to 12 months of age, presents with seizure and fever, and if this child has not received the hip vaccine and pneumococcal vaccine, then better to do a lumbar puncture. So between 6 to 12 months, because this is the most common age for 
uh, hip causing meningitis as well as for invasive pneumococcal disease. So, if the child has not been vaccinated and develops a seizure, better to do the LP. And any child with seizure and fever and if he has meningeal signs, then do the LP. If some child fever, seizure was admitted outside, received antibiotics and then has come to you, then better to do the LP because antibiotics may sometimes mask the meningeal signs. So when you examine this child, you may not get any meningeal signs. So better to do the lumbar puncture. If it's a complex febrile seizure, so in addition to the blood investigations which we did for simple febrile, you have to do EEG, neuroimaging and lumbar puncture in complex febrile seizure. So how do we treat a febrile seizure? So one is acute management, home therapy and what do we do in the hospital and what can we do to prevent it? So acute management, benzodiazepine is the drug of choice. That is we have to give either medazolam or lorazepam. So this is the drug for acute management. If the child is at home, is a known febrile seizure, then you can give a midazolam nasal spray. So dose is 0.2 to 0.4 mg per kg per dose. Or you can use a rectal diazepam at a dose of 0.5 mg per kg per dose. So this is at home. Once the child comes to the hospital, you can use midazolam or lorazepam 0.1 mg per kg per dose, either IV or IM. For any child with fever, so antipyretic measures are most important. You can give a thorough tepid sponging and you can use paracetamol, either a suppository or syrup, 15 mg per kg per dose. If the child is not allergic, you can use even mephenamic acid or ibuprofen also for antipyretics. So now most of the parents get really worried when their child throws a febrile seizure. So what can we do to prevent the recurrences? So other than the antipyretic measures, there is something called continuous or intermittent prophylaxis, which we can use. But for a child with simple febrile seizure, there is no need to put the child on any prophylaxis to prevent the recurrences. So in whom do we need to start the intermittent prophylaxis? If the child has frequent seizures in a short period of time, like three or more in six months or four or more in one year, then we have to start this child on prophylaxis. Second is if the seizures last for longer time, more than 15 minutes and require drugs to stop the seizure, then again we'll have to uh, start the child on intermittent prophylaxis. So what is the drug of choice for intermittent prophylaxis? Clobazam is the preferred drug at the dose of 0.75 mg per kg per day in two divided doses. So then who are the children who will need a continuous prophylaxis? So if it is more than six per year, so if it was around three to four, we would start the child on intermittent. But if it is more than six per year, in spite of intermittent prophylaxis, then you have to put this child on a continuous prophylaxis. Or if the child presents with febrile status epilepticus, again this child needs a continuous prophylaxis. So the drugs that we can use is, if the child is less than one year, phenobarbitone is preferred. Dose we have already uh, saw on it, it is 3 to 5 mg per kg per day. If the child is more than one year, you can start on sodium valproate. Again, duration is for a period of one to two years. So just summing up this whole febrile seizure, if a child presents to you with fever and convulsion, take a detailed history to know whether it is simple febrile or complex febrile. Examine the child to see for any meningitis or encephalitis like features. Manage the acute seizure, the acute illness. Then you determine the risk factor for recurrence and for febrile seizure. You have to counsel the parents. You determine the risk factor for later epilepsy. If there are no risk, then you can just monitor the child. If it is high risk, then you do a EEG and maybe then you have to put the child on intermittent prophylaxis. So I hope uh, it was quite clear for you. If you have any doubts, you can mail me. Thank you.